Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, Do like you have a PowerPoint or not? Uh, no, no. no. So um, yes, so since I'm a last minute replacement here for our uh, vice president, uh, I'll just briefly present myself. My name is Alexander Shushnyar. Uh, I'm a member of the executive committee of the European Students' Union. Originally, I come from uh, Croatia, where I've also been a student representative at all levels, and, uh, and currently uh, in ESU, I'm uh, working in a cluster for quality of uh, higher education. So this is why I'm here. Uh, yes, I don't have a PowerPoint. I actually thought that this was going to be more like a panel kind of discussion, so that's why. Uh, and my talk will also differ a bit from the first two in, in regard to the topic, because uh, what, I, what I planned was um, maybe like a brief overview of the European Students' Union position on digital education, digital learning in, in general, not, not that much about the open education as a concept. Uh, I can only say on this topic, uh, express our, our utmost support. I mean, you have you have seen in this presentation, but also yesterday, I think it's it, I think it's quite clear what the public value, as we have heard uh, of this, is, and uh, the, the students will always be very supportive of this in in any way that we can. Uh, however, what I wanted to talk about today, it, it, that is, the, the, to present a couple of key points, key points in our in our position towards digital learning and digital education, or just a couple of the most important ones, of course, and hopefully in this way stimulate discussion. As from what I have seen yesterday, I'm afraid that I will come off as an educational traditionalist now, which is not the role that I'm used to, <laughs> believe me, as a student representative, but we will see. So yes, th this, this would be uh, the aim, and in any case, I would start with uh, with the opportunities, with the possibilities uh, that we perceive in, in this whole digitalization uh, process. Uh, first of all, there, there is, yes, I, I also didn't mention, so most of what I'm going to uh, say today is based on consultations that the European Student Union has done during a specific event on this topic with the National Student Union. So this is the way that we try to cover and, and, and gather the student opinion on this. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so number one thing that I would mention is something that I think um, is, is, is often left out and in a way it goes without saying, it is often taken for granted, and this is that this digitalization process actually improves the quality of the learning resources, as, as, as learning resources. So. Just for example, we have also yesterday heard all these comparisons through, through ages. I mean, before we students had books and it was basically only one mode of delivery, right? So you have a paper with printed letters on it. You read it, you try to absorb knowledge. Uh, only uh, the, the using these new opportunities on its own, I think it's worth, worth it to emphasize and state clearly that it's a big, big improvement. Of course, we have multimedia, we, we have uh, much more diverse resources, we have uh, resources which uh, cater actually to different kind of learning strategies which the learners can adapt. And that brings me to the second, to the second big, uh, big point of, uh, of, of opportunity that we see, and this is individualization of the learning process. Um, of which we have, of course, uh, always supported and which is a big topic and a big goal, so to say, in uh, pedagogy, at least in recent decades. So it has been recognized as a worthy goal. It has been recognized, of course, in accordance with all the constructivist principles that not everyone starts at the same point and not everyone will finish at the same point after the uh, educational process. So the individualization and somehow tailoring education in accordance with individual needs is something positive. And here the digitalization again can be very, very useful of course. It can uh, enable the learner to learn at his own pace, uh, to use, as I have mentioned previously, because of all these varying learning resources, those learning strategies that are more, uh, that are better for him or her, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the third point that I would, uh, that I would emphasize as especially a uh, big opportunity for the students is maybe, maybe a bit controversial one because of what we have uh, also heard, but it's also covered in a lot of research uh, uh, 
as not particularly successful, and that is the social dimension of higher education. So, uh, in a way, improving access. Uh, yeah, we have heard, and like I said, a lot of papers actually research this, that what has, while, while this has been an original intention, it has not succeeded in this intention. Uh, of course, the original intention was uh, if we somehow, may, that, that these digital resources are in a way much more, uh, much more available, they're much more they're easier to transmit, etc., etc., then than, uh, than the physical face-to-face -face educational process, and in, a way, in this way this will broaden access. This has not happened, unfortunately. However, I would say that we are still op very optimistic about the potential of these new technologies in improving access, and that in the long term we honestly do believe that this is going to happen. And I would list at least two reasons for this optimism in this positive uh, correlation of these new technologies and accessibility of higher education. One is, of course, that, uh, that uh, as, as time progresses, uh, younger and younger children are more and more competent in this, uh, with, with, in these digital skills. So I think it can be expected that this barrier to entry to this digital kind of education with lower so to say, spontaneously in time. But also, it can be lower in, in, uh, in less spontaneous ways. I think, of course, to uh, integration of these digital technologies in pre-tertiary uh, education. So once this has been integrated already in primary and secondary schools, then, of course, it, it should become much easier for all learners to access such resources uh, at the higher education level. Now, that being said, uh, and these three big biggest points of, of support uh, being uh, listed. Uh, the the uh, position of the, the European Students' Union is, and this is not to be misinterpreted in this, what, what I have been said, uh, the part about social dimension, is not that this digital education should replace traditional education, in, in, in any foreseeable future at least, but that it should supplement it. Uh, in, in a way, just, just to uh, show how this is not contradictory with what I have previously said, so bro broadening accessibility uh, does not, of course, necessarily be to offer the whole study program, even the whole course to the people. What, uh, well, where primarily it can have a positive influence on social dimension is in many of the European countries. I think this is the case, uh, if not all, that, that of course the rural uh, areas of countries are also the ones which are in more difficult socioeconomic position. And so you have actually an amplification effect which presents a really high barrier to, uh, to entrance to higher education. Uh, living expenses and especially accommodation are the biggest expenses and so it's very hard for these students to access as opposed to, for example, students who already live with their families in big university cities. Uh, here, of course, digital technologies can help even when they are not like completely distance learning. But it, th there is a middle ground here, is what I'm trying to say, is that even if you lower the demand of physical uh, presence, already this has helped, already this has increased uh, access. And in general, this is what, uh, what our position is, that, that the integration of traditional methods, or at least those traditional methods that serve us well, and the new technologies is, uh, is the best way to go forward. Uh, furthermore, the, when, when, when we compare, and this is of course often compared, the, the traditional or so-called traditional, the current, I would say, uh, methods of, of teaching and learning, uh, and these new technologies, e-learning, etc., what we must not do, I think, is compare what we have now in traditional learning and what we would implement in e-learning. But I think we need to take a look at the potential of it. Just to use an example from, from yesterday, as we heard uh, about the, the critique of, the, of MOOCs, how they are, they are too big, thousands of students, uh, how can you actually pay attention to individual students? And the answer is that we romanticize traditional education, for example, because what, what about the 400 person lectures? And, but the answer for me is very obvious. N neither of it is good. The difference of e-learning cannot be that the traditional learning is doing some things wrong. 
And we have been saying for ages that you cannot have classes with 400 people. This, at least, I, please correct me if I'm wrong, maybe this is a good point for this guy. I, I cannot conceive of a need for a 400 person class. Because the way I see it, this can only be one directional, this can only be a professor talking, students listening. And if this is the case, then really, as we have also <laughs> heard in some of the presentations, then the students can just watch a video. There's really no need for them to be there. So in this regard, yes, 400 students' lectures are completely replaceable, I think. But they should not be 400. Uh, student uh, student lectures, and this is precisely the, the 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 integration that I have been speaking about. We think that it is very well possible. Of course, what is needed is some fund uh, fund foundations for any course for any study programs, and then the students can of course watch video, use multimedia, or use any kind of digital technologies that will be possible in the future, and dedicate this precious, so to say, face to face contact. To the to more creative uh, creative environment between the teacher and the student, which then of course cannot be 400 uh, student lectures. And finally, uh, just a couple couple of words on uh, implementation. Uh, so some of the things that I will say will be very practical, but firstly. Uh, the one which I think almost directly follows what I have been said about not comparing the current state but comparing uh, potentials is that when implementing at universities particularly uh, e-learning uh, and digital technologies and trying to push all of this forward, uh, it is particularly important to take care of what uh, is the state of uh, mechanisms, particularly uh, quality assurance and management mechanisms at the faculty, and to ensure in a way that implementation is not superficial. Now, of course, this is a very general point, and this goes for any kind of change they introduce. But uh, I think it's still good to, to emphasize this, because it can be, I think, quite dangerous to, to introduce uh, these new technologies, these new ways of, of education, if we do not have those presuppositions. Uh, already implemented. And I'll just give you a practical example because this all might sound a bit too theoretical. I had an encounter with uh, one faculty actually that uh, tried to produce and actually produced the whole study program online. So I asked them, I was a bit skeptical, I admit, so I asked them, uh, but are you sure, uh, are, are you sure that those students which take this online study program, which paralleled completely the, 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 the traditional one that they had. So it was the same program, which was only moved online. So I asked them, but do you know that the, do the students have at least comparable, uh, comparable learning outcomes? Do they achieve the, the same things? And they say, yes, 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 don't worry, don't worry. We, test, they, we give them the same tests, and uh, it's all good. They, they do not have lower achievement. I'm like, okay, but, and then I asked their students about uh, these tests. What, what, what I found out then, that the tests are basically just information checking, something that never has actually demanded face-to-face -face communication at all, if you understand me. The students might have as well read the books and then went to the tests. Honestly speaking, when I, when I heard those questions, this is higher education, of course, but this was level four EQF descriptors at the best, at the best. So what, what, was, what we see here is a problem on its own, but a problem that is aggravated in a way by implementing new technologies. And, and I think it's very important to be mindful of this when implementing them, to be mindful of the things that should be in place before, before we have this. This is, of course, don't get me wrong, not an argument of to, for not implementing these new technologies in new ways. This is an argument for being careful, for diagnosing the situation, and if we see that we have such problems of just correcting them and having those, implementing those mechanisms uh, before. 
other concerns of implementation are much more practical, uh, m much more practical indeed, and some of them uh, mentioned. Uh, I think Anthony Camilleri yesterday yesterday said that and uh, that, that that we might be a few steps forward in in especially some some regards. Uh, and yes, I also personally have worked with the professors which do not know how to use an email. And now we are trying to implement these very, uh, these, these, these very demanding technologies. And how do, how do we do it? There is no way to do it if you do not have professional development behind it, I think. Professional development is, is, is also a condition for all other changes that we are trying to implement in higher education. This is what we always try to emphasize, but it is, it is, it is often acknowledged, yes, yes, of course, of course that we need professional development, but then nothing is done about it. And huge changes are demanded from, from the teachers, but there is no professional development to back it up. And in this, and I don't think this is, this is in any way achievable, especially with something like new technologies, which is something so skill, uh, so, so skill, uh, in a way so skill specific. Uh, and another thing, of course, uh, regarding the, the superficial uh, implementation, which again is not something which is uh, specific for digital education. Of course, Bologna reform has huge problems with superficial implementation, and or, or what I like to call purely formal implementation, where where uh, higher education institutions or even the government agencies uh, like to say that something or write that something has been done in certain ways. But in the real world, it's either superficially implemented and ineffectual uh, or even non non-existent. So I have also encountered, uh, these are, of course, like relatively lesser developed countries of Eastern Europe or Southeastern Europe, but I have seen uh, higher education institutions saying ad advanced, there are advanced online tools. So this was the expression, advanced online tools. And when I t took a look what this is, these were basically repositories which had the which had the added option of making surveys and tests, the closed type, of course. And so, at calling this advanced was I mean, preposterous, I think. But it served to satisfy the demands of policy set by the government, because the government said, okay, this needs to be this is a policy, and so they said, okay, yes, we have this. Okay, so we satisfy this. Like I said, this is not specific to digital education, but digital education being again very uh, uh, dependent on the, on on this very again specific set of skills skills in the area of uh, technology, which currently uh, relatively few people in the, in the academia possess, is especially susceptible to such kind of things. Because just to compare it in in some other area where a lot of people have those skills. You couldn't call this advanced. Someone would say, come on, people, this doesn't make any sense at all. But since not a lot of people were trained in this, not a lot of people understood this new area, this was possible in a way to completely turn, uh, turn the things around. So that would be it for me. And feel free to ask any questions, of course. Thank you very much, Alexander. Any questions? So I would like to react a little bit to the position of European Student Union. It's a very interesting, actually, what you have now presented. It's very good that you walk on quality assurance, I think. And um, I have um, some um, thought development that, that was during your presentation that I would like to share with you. Actually, uh, we are watching uh, from presentations, from different experience, innovations, um, cases uh, from European Union, that uh, experience is very diverse. And all of us are looking at the best experience, trying like to find the way what would be the best for us, for the teachers, for academics, universities. So it is very interesting actually what students need. And uh, what I heard from your presentation is that uh, uh, you really are targeting at maybe best experiences, but it would be very interesting to have more concrete expectations from students. For example, when you say, when you speak about traditional environment of studies in higher education, um, we can all recall 
maybe you also can recall, um, different practices as well. When teachers talk for three hours in, in lectures, <laughs> and maybe other seminars where you have very good interactive experiences. The same to, to my experience, uh, I, I, I had a lot um, of experience uh, assessing online courses. I also had different experiences of finding uh, like um, passive learning instances and then also very active learning instances. And uh, if we refer to some presentations from yesterday, the idea from Philip Schmidt, for example, was even to break out organizations and to go for uncontrolled environments, but very creative, interesting experiences with the real world. So this is a radical vision for the future. And we come from the very radical experience from traditional universities. Now if I stand in the middle, actually I wouldn't know what message to bring to my academy when I listen to you. Why? Um, it should be safe somehow, to, to my understanding, you know. But, uh, I am not certain if really then students would love this breaking experience towards interesting, dynamic, you know, online exchange, what you are doing usually in non-formal settings. If so, you know, the road is very, very difficult because actually what we as organizations, as higher education universities, uh, universities, higher education institutions, and also ministries would need to do is to work a lot in order to change quality assurance standards. Because they put us in the frame. Um, teachers and universities need to report to ministries on the um, um, registered students, on their activities, on what they do. They need to provide three every three years reports, you know, and they are very, very fixed in the frame. So now, if we want to break this frame, we need to decide. But from what I hear from you, is actually it's a cozy environment, not so much online, but uh, it, uh, it, I think it would be useful if this position would be more clearer on what you would like to do in the classroom, hmm? in the physical, in the online environment. And then, uh, on the, I, I understand, for example, that big groups is already a problem because it's actually self-learning or passive learning, information transference and information receiving. There's no practicing. What about practicing? If you do practicing and then you have peer learning assessment or tutored assessment or whatever it is. So, you know, if you plunged into more concrete details and then would try to formulate your need from bottom up, I think it would be more useful than to come with a position, you know, about the decisions, because the decisions are up to the ministries and up to, to academies, but they should be based on your needs. Uh, I'm sorry, this is my reaction to what you're saying. Thank you. Yeah, so um, just to reply, yes, so the, the, the idea, uh, I think that if I understood you properly, I think that we agree on, on one thing definitely, and this is that the goals need to be set in accordance with the needs of the learner, and then we need to see how best to achieve it to, to these goals. I mean, for me, this is a very common sense notion. I think hardly anyone would disagree. What maybe people would disagree about is uh, what combination of traditional and these new technologies uh, gives this the best, best outcomes. And this is what I have tried uh, to somehow delineate here. Uh, about uh, the, the student's position uh, regarding things that you have mentioned is, probably best to, to, to refer to the concept of student-centered learning that we have been working on for, for many, many years. Uh, successfully, of course, implemented it in various documents, finally in the ESGs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that the questions that you have posed now are best explained in this concept. I, I have not touched here on the concept of student-centered learning because then I would need to go at least seven or eight facets of it. So both the teaching methods, the quality assurance, the professional development, the social. So these are only four, the seven of eight of them. But I believe this concept uh, and the, the way that we have suggested it applied holds enough, uh, so to say, explanatory power to, to, to suggest what the students really want in the classroom. Um, I, that, 
I would say if I would have to signal out a few things, students, of course, do love uh, more interactive, uh, more engaging things, whether they are online or face-to-face. -face. This is, I think, something that a lot of practitioners uh, are completely aware of. It is not easy, of course, to, to develop methods in accordance with it, but these student needs can be relatively easily recognized. Can I development and the use of open educational resources. You know, an example, very small. If, teach, if students would like more diverse opinion, not of a single teacher, you know, but on validated selection of diverse opinion online, for example, and if we had uh, the courage to implement it, when NQA or quality assurance agencies come to universities, they would not maybe check so detailed the research articles which are on scopus or high level citation level, but practices on this. So this is a decision actually, and it should come also from the student. So if students support it, then academics would implement it, then universities would accept this decision and ministries, but we need your support if you want it. Thanks. I also would like to make a comment. Uh, I think we, are, we all have <laughs> a lot to say, but very quickly, because otherwise you will miss coffee. No, thank you so much. First of all, thank you so much for your presentation. I think you, you brought some issues that we all have to, to talk and discuss and, and this interface between universities and, and the students. Um, one thing that is, is just something to keep in mind about your work on finding out the digitalization processes, whether students like it or not, and possibilities for widening access. You talked a lot about access, but sometimes also about accessibility. But our understanding of accessibility is more with regards to challenged, physically challenged learners. Right? Whether they will have, they are at universal level, they have some sort of physical restrictions, therefore accessibility to the ones who cannot hear well, you know, cannot see well, those sorts of things could perhaps be taken into account when, when you were thinking of the power of digital resources to uh, increase, increase access. So this is something that we can talk later. The other thing is uh, um, following um, Irina's comment has to do with, uh, I'm, I'm very curious because um, we, for example, the video example that you gave, uh, whilst I can see your point absolutely clearly, I was also thinking from the part of the teacher, of the lecturer, of perhaps the type of methodology or pedagogy used uh, could have been that it was a flipped classroom exercise where you just give the video and you say it's entirely up to you, student, now to go through this because I'm working on with you on something else. And, you know, this may not be crucial to this course or may, even if it is crucial to this course, that's the methodology, the pedagogy behind teaching. So I'm wondering if you're taking into consideration your analysis and discussion with your peer students, the type of pedagogy and methodology chosen by the, the teacher you know, f for doing what they are doing. Uh, and also whether, you know, a multiple choice assessment wasn't enough to assess what the teacher wanted to assess. Was it really required to go through extreme uh, assessments and dialogues, etc.? Maybe a multiple choice test was enough. So th the thing is, when uh, gathering information from, from students across Europe, it would be very important to think of those aspects behind the face value of technology use, I think. And, I, you know, I don't know if you want to say something about it in one minute or not or whatever. But please. No, but but <laughs> basically, no, I just uh, agree with you definitely, uh, especially on the, on the first point. Yes, I use the, uh, I use the example of access uh, so socioeconomically based, but of course there are learning, learning disabilities as well with which new technologies can, uh, so not only physical, but also learning disabilities with which, which it can help very much, so definitely. And regarding the second point as well, of course, yeah, it's a valid point that, it, that the pedagogy use needs to be taken into account. I would say also new pedagogies need to be formed, new researched. We cannot just, in a way, transpose it on, on the new technologies. And uh, yes, yeah, ESSO will actually develop its official policy uh, on, on digital education in 2017. So when we are doing it, thank you, this will be taken into account, definitely. Thanks. Okay, Is, does anyone really have to? Okay. <laughs> because otherwise you'll miss coffee entirely. Um, it's a really quick one, but just um, going back to um, what we were talking about in terms of the legal position of um, copyright ownership. So um, in England, uh, the, the situation is, is that, uh, and th this is um, similar to many European countries, although obviously there are some legal differences, 
I'm being very quick. In England, students have ownership and control of their own work legally, not like unlike employees of organisations. So actually, they're in a better position in terms of creating open resources, sharing open resources, all of these other kinds of things. However, very few staff are actually aware of the legal position of students, and very few students tend to be aware of their legal position in terms of copyright and IP over their own um, work. What happens in England very often is that students are required to, on entry to the university to sign away their rights. So they give yeah. their IP and their copyright. So yeah. this, to me, is a really, really important critical issue that I would love to see much more activism and much more kind of address being given because it, it's, it's a really, really critical issue within digital context. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, it's not only England. So uh, very often, yes, students when they're writing, a, uh, when they're signing a contract on entry, they sign away their their rights, and this is a big problem. I would say that the only only reason this hasn't caused a, a much bigger outrage between students is that unfortunately, in many countries, the production itself is very low, and therefore the number of students that have encountered this problem is very low, which of course that does not mean that this should not be worked on, we are working on it. And But I, I think that also this uh, mentality is changing in a way that more and more people are realizing research, for example, is not for a PhD, not even only for MA. We need to start from the beginning. And so hopefully more and more students will produce and hopefully then m people who make decisions will, re will realize that this is actually not the best way to go about it.